Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Uh, gosh, I'm sorry to the uh, group that was at home on Wednesday. I totally uh, spaced recording this, so, so I'm sorry. I've been sort of wrapped up with family stuff here, and uh, I've <laughs> been a little off track. So I apologize for that. We'll get things uh, rolling back through here and be uh, on pace again here after spring break. All right, so uh, we're talking about Hardy Weinberg. Uh, the idea of Hardy Weinberg is to figure out our populations evolving and how can we measure that okay so the purpose of the hardy weinberg concept is to see how populations change over time or, or measure how populations change over time and that's done by looking at changes in allele frequency of the population so there are two equations that you need to be able to use these equations will be provided on the equation sheet on the ap bio exam but I'm sure you'll have them memorized and just be able to use them. Now, uh, there is an assignment that you're going to be working on uh, on Friday that is a pogle about Hardy-Weinberg. And, of course, we'll do some practice with Hardy-Weinberg when we get back uh, from break. Uh, but the basic idea is if we measure allele frequencies in a population, if those frequencies change, well, then the population has evolved, right? So uh, for the two equations, one equation is P plus Q equals 1. P is simply the frequency of a dominant allele, and Q is the frequency of a recessive allele, and your possibilities will equal one, so that's, that's your first equation. Uh, this is assuming two alleles for a particular gene. Uh, then if we use the second equation, that's looking at the frequencies of particular genotypes. Since organisms uh, will typically be diploid, since a lot of what we study is a, a diploid uh, population, uh, you've got two copies of an allele, so you can look at the frequency of different genotypes, hence your P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared. And again, possibilities all equal one. All right, so uh, let's look at the idea here. Uh, with evolution, individuals uh, live and die, reproduce or don't, uh, and as a result of that, the population will change over time. So with things like natural selection, uh, you, know, you might have little cute little mice that uh, are adapted for the particular environments in which they live. So over time, the population will change to better match the uh, environmental pressures, and that's going to change the allele frequency. So as the population changes, the allele frequencies change. And of course, you know, ideally things, populations become better adapted. All right, so it all starts with variation, right? There are uh, differences in individuals in populations. All that variation initially arises from mutation, right? You change the DNA, that could change the amino acid sequence, which changes how proteins fold up. Uh, could be bad, could be neutral, could be helpful, but that ultimately gives rise to new traits, okay? And then you shuffle things up with meiosis. So between meiosis and mutation, that's gonna create variation in populations. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, some individuals are gonna be better suited and more likely to survive and reproduce. All right, uh, let's see. So uh, here, a population, uh, in terms of working definitions, a population is members of one species in a defined area. So it could be like people in Marion County, okay? So one species in a defined area. And then in this case, the gene pool is comprised of all the alleles of the members of a particular population, okay? Uh, now, what can happen is you can have the frequency of those alleles change in the population uh, over time. Oops, excuse me, somebody's knocking at the door. Okay, so uh, sorry for that. Uh, but yeah, the idea is members of one species in a defined area, they possess a certain combination of alleles. And then over time, uh, the frequency of those alleles may change and uh, that's a, a, a way to measure evolutionary change. All right. So there are five ways populations can change, and you definitely need to know this. Okay. One way to change the uh, population or make a population evolve is by having mutations occur. Mutations change allele frequencies, right? Because you create new alleles or new possibilities uh, in the population. So absolutely, mutation is a way to uh, create variation, and then change the frequency of alleles in a population. So it just crops up naturally. Uh, another way populations can change is through gene flow. 
Uh, the idea of gene flow is that populations, you know, different uh, groups of a particular species can intermingle or commingle and members can move from one population to another. Okay. So you can imagine, you know, people uh, moving to different parts of the world, uh, or you can imagine, um, you know, herds of animals migrating, you know, if different populations are mi migrating through the same general area at the same general time, members of those two different herds may uh, intermix. So, uh, you know, gene flow is basically when organisms move to a different population, they basically, they take their genes with them, right? So that changes the allele frequency of the original population and the new population. Uh, so what gene flow does is it sort of redistributes the frequency of, of alleles and that reduces differences between populations. Uh, or here, here they talk about, you know, wind uh, can spread pollinate, pollen from one seed or one field to another. Uh, even like non-GMO organic raised uh, plants will still have like a one, two, sometimes even 3% uh, of its genome be genes from genetically modified organisms, just because insects and wind can spread uh, pollen from one field to another. Uh, let's see, another way populations change is through non-random mating. Uh, the idea is, well, sexual selection, right? With sexual selection, individuals will choose mates based on certain characteristics. So there is some choice as to you know, what organisms survive and reproduce. Uh, so for a population to be not evolving, you would need random mating. So non-random mating is a form of sexual selection. And again, that can change the allele frequencies in the population because if members of a certain population are choosing mates for particular reasons, um, a lot of times what will happen in like fruit flies, uh, fruit flies tend to pick mates who were raised on a similar food source, okay? So if they're raised on a similar food source, they tend to choose those individuals when given the opportunity uh, to mate. Uh, let's see, drift is another uh, way populations can change. Remember, drift is chance change in allele frequency. Uh, what happens is you have some sort of event, whether individuals in a founding group split off uh, or you can have some cataclysmic event. But what happens is the small group that remains uh, may have allele frequencies that are different from the larger group. And again, because it happens by chance, it's not necessarily adaptive. Okay? Uh, and then finally, the fifth way populations change, well, natural selection, right? The environment can influence who survives and reproduces and who doesn't. And so that's a, another way that populations can change. So here is the deal. For a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it's got to be a large population to avoid drift or chance changes in allele frequency. There's got to be random mating so that every organism has equal opportunity to reproduce and pass on its genes. There needs to be no migration, nobody in, nobody out, so that you don't have uh, gene flow occur. There's no natural selection uh, again, everybody gets the opportunity to reproduce, and there's no mutation. Uh, so you don't get new alleles introduced in the population. Now, does that seem realistic at all to have large, randomly mating, not migrating, no natural selection, and no mutations in a population? No, it's, it's absurd, right? That just doesn't happen. So why do we have Hardy-Weinberg in the first place? Well, it's there for a basis of comparison, right? In a hardy Weinberg population, there is no change. But in reality, populations are changing all the time. But hardy Weinberg gives us a benchmark or a comparison. Okay. So in reality, populations don't generally exist in hardy Weinberg equilibrium because individuals move in and out of populations, because mutations occur. Right. So there's a whole host of reasons why hardy Weinberg doesn't really happen. But we have Hardy-Weinberg as a control. So you can take measurements of allele frequencies in a population at 0.1 in time. And then later on at 0.2, you can check allele frequencies again and see, oh, hey, allele frequency changed, the population evolved. So Hardy-Weinberg is basically here for the basis of comparison. All right, so let's look at the equation. So Hardy-Weinberg is named after these two guys that sort of independently came up with the concept. So you know, they're both given credit here. 
Uh, so again, the, the basic Hardy-Weinberg equation is you've got two alleles for a particular gene. Uh, P is used to designate the dominant allele, uh, and Q represents the recessive allele. And since all possibilities have to equal one, P plus Q equals one. So again, P is the frequency of the dominant allele, Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. Now for the second equation, um, we're looking at genotypes, okay? So when we're looking at the frequency of genotypes, since organisms we're typically looking at are diploid, it's the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals is P squared, right? If you're homozygous dominant, you have two dominant alleles, so we say P squared. If you're homozygous recessive, well, you have two recessive alleles, so that's Q squared. But if you're heterozygous, you could have gotten a dominant or recessive allele from either parent, right? So you could have gotten P from mom, Q from dad, or recessive or dominant from mom, recessive from dad, or the reverse. So that's why you use two PQ. Okay. So the equation here for the genotypes of individuals is P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. Again, don't sweat memorizing this. The equations are provided. Just know what the terms mean. Okay, that's the big thing. Uh, let's see. So this is just a general rule of thumb. When you're talking about the population, you'll use your P plus Q. Because, again, it's the frequency of the dominant recessive alleles in the population. When you're talking about individuals, how many individuals or what percentage of the population uh, is homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive or heterozygous? You can calculate that. Uh, so how do we solve Hardy-Weinberg? Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, I forgot. You know, here's one of the uh, creators of the equation. I just thought he resembled my brother. This is my brother, Pete. Um, he's an assistant athletic director at McCutcheon High School. So I don't know. Whatever. Uh, so how do you solve Hardy-Weinberg stuff? Well, you begin by writing down both equations. The P plus Q equals 1 and the P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Then the big thing to do is to look at a story problem, figure out, okay, what information do they give me? What information do they give me? And I will tell you, on the AP exam, every question I've ever seen, they basically give you Q squared. Uh, because Q squared is how often you see the recessive trait. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward because the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals is Q squared. Well, then you can find Q, right? But what if they give you the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals? If, you're home, if you have the homozygous dominant trait, you could be, I'm sorry, if you have the dominant trait, you could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So you don't, there's no way to parse that out. So generally speaking, in a story problem, they'll give you the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals, which is Q squared. And the very first thing you do, like your number one priority with this every single time, find Q first. Q is the magic number there. Once you find Q, you can figure out everything else. So always, always, always find Q first. Okay, so here we have a couple of practice problems. It says, assuming a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, if 64% of the individuals in the population exhibit the recessive appearance, what percentage of the gene pool is the dominant allele? Okay, so 64% of individuals have the recessive appearance. Again, to look recessive, to have the recessive geno or phenotype, you have to be homozygous recessive. So what they give you is Q squared. So if Q squared is 0.64, uh, find the square root of that, that means Q is 8. So again, what did they give us? They give us Q squared. What percent of the population is homozygous recessive? We take the square root of that and find Q, which is 0.8. Well, P plus Q equals 1. So if Q is 0.8, then P is 0.2. Once we have Q and P, we can solve anything, right? And what do they ask for? The percentage of the gene pool that has the dominant allele? Well, that's just P, right? So the answer is 0.2 or, or 20%. All right. Uh, for a par population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, if 16% of the population displays the recessive trait, what percent of the population is homozygous dominant? What percentage is heterozygous? Well, again, 16% displays the recessive trait. That's Q squared. So if 0.6 is Q squared, we take the square root. 
that's 0.4. So if Q squared is 0.6, we take the square root. Q is 0.4. That means P plus Q is 1, so P would be 0.6, and now we can find anything. So what percentage of population is homozygous dominant? To be homozygous dominant, that's P squared, right? So 0.6 times 0.6 is 0.36. And then it says, what percentage of population is heterozygous? Well, that's 2PQ, right? So that's 2 times 0.4 times 0.6. It's 0.24. It's 0.48. So the answer for this question is 0.36 is the frequency of the homozygous dominant trait. And 0.48 is the frequency of individuals being heterozygous. So again, usually they're going to give you Q squared. You, find, you take the square root and find Q. And then you can solve anything else. So it's pretty straightforward. All right, so again, keys to victory, find Q first, always, always, always. Know that it's usually Q squared. There's not a guarantee with that, but usually that's what you're looking for in this stuff. When we're talking about individuals and the traits they possess, that's, you know, since they are uh, got two alleles for this, uh, then you're looking for P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared. And then we're talking about uh, frequency of the alleles, it's P and Q. All right, that is it, folks. So work on that pogo. Uh, when we come back, we'll do some other practice with this. Uh, we'll get into some uh, chi-square review, and we should be good. Hey, hope you have a great break. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you later.